Hi guys, Justin again from chemistrynotes.com and this is video number two from section one. Section one is foundations of chemistry. In the last video we talked primarily about scientific method. We also talked about the macroscopic versus the microscopic view. Uh, this video we're going to start talking about units of measurement. So I'm going to introduce to you something called SI base units or SI fundamental units. Also SI derived units. Some of the prefixes that we use in chemistry. And then we're going to start to talk about uncertainty in measurement. All right. I might also throw in a little bit on mass versus weight. So we got a pretty busy video here. This is section one, video number two. So let's get started. Top of page one of today's notes. Units of measurement. Measurements are quantitative observations that consist of two parts. A number, for example, four, and a unit, for example, grams. You put those two guys together and you have a measurement, for example, four grams. Now, believe it or not, the unit is actually more important than the number because the unit kind of dials in a little closer than just a plain old number about where you are at. So grams, will be more important than the four. A lot of people leave off units. You have to include your units, okay, in every measurement. All right, first bullet point there. For measurements in different parts of the world to be comparable and meaningful, a standard system has been adopted. Now, this system is called the SI system of units. I've heard people say that, oh, the SI system is it's just the metric system today. and. Uh, I've also heard some people say, well, the SI system is very similar to the metric system with a few, a few differences. And there's different points of view on this. I just basically say to my students, the SI system is very, very similar to the metric system. They have a lot of similarities. All right, the SI stands for Système International. That's French. It's just an international system of units. And there are five fundamental SI units to know. Fundamental units, the SI fundamental units, are often called SI base units. So if you ever see SI base units, it means the same thing as SI fundamental units. So what are these five fundamental SI units that I need to know? And these are units that are not derived from every, anybody else. These are original fundamental base units, okay? So I'm gonna make a list of five here, mass, the unit is kilogram, abbreviated kg. Length, the SI base unit is meter, or fundamental unit, abbreviation M. Time, second, abbreviation S, not SEC, S. Temperature Kelvin, abbreviation K, not degrees K, just plain old K, all right? The amount of something, we'll learn a lot about the mole later on. And the abbreviation for the mole is only one letter short, M-O-L, all right? Those are the five fundamental SI units to know. I didn't say that's all the fundamental SI units. There's actually seven. So there's actually seven SI base units or fundamental units, but the other two we don't, we don't use very much in general chemistry, so we can ignore those, all right? Those are uh, the electric current with the unit of ampere, and luminous intensity that has a unit of candela. We will use electric current, right, the amp, in section 17, electrochemistry, but very sparingly, and we would never use luminous intensity, candela. So you got your five fundamental SI units up there, okay? Those are my SI base units. I can get derived units from mixing and matching those base units. And that's what the second bullet point down there is referring to. It says all other units, for example, volume, density, all other units are derived units because they're derived from the seven fundamental or base units. As an example, I had mentioned density, right? We will learn density is mass over volume, right? So mass could be in grams your volume would be actually also a derived unit because volume is length cubed, right? So density and volume are two examples of derived units. 
Okay. So with that, I need to mention something. It says there for mass that the base unit is the gram. It says for length, the base unit is the meter. These are relatively large amounts for a topic or subject such as chemistry, right? In chemistry, things weigh on the order of nanograms, micrograms, picograms. They're very, very small. A gram is pretty big. Also, a meter. You ever seen a meter stick or like a yardstick? A meter is, I mean, what if you wanted to know the diameter of a hydrogen atom? You're not going to use the meter. You're going to want to use prefixes, okay? And that's what the top of page two of today's notes are talking about. The fundamental SI units are not always useful. So prefixes are often used. And by useful, I mean, they're not, it's not useful to report the mass of an electron in kilograms, all right? I think I misspoke. Earlier, I, or just now, when I was kind of talking off the top of my head, the SI base unit for mass is not grams, it's kilograms. So there are seven prefixes to know. Here are the larger ones, kilo and mega. There are others. These are the two larger prefixes that you should know. One kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. One megagram, that's a big M there, capital M. One megagram is a million grams or 10 to the six grams. Now, some of the smaller units are deci. Deci is 10, 10 decigrams is one gram. Centi, as an example, 100 centimeters is a meter. Milli is a thousand, right? As an example, 1000 milligrams is equal to one gram. Micro, getting smaller and smaller, micro, one million, my, it takes one million of those little micrograms to make one gram. Okay, 10 to the six micrograms equals one gram. Even smaller, okay, nano, nano, 10 to the ninth nanograms is equal to one gram. All right, now we will use these when we start to use dimensional analysis and when we start to do unit conversions and that's coming up very soon, even in this video. All right, mass versus weight. Now I wanted to throw this in. This is just a real quick entry before we return to types of units and measurements. Mass versus weight. These terms are not interchangeable. Now we use these every day and we interchange them all the time when with our friends, okay? How much does he weigh? How, how much does this? What's the mass of this? We kind of interchange them all the time, but mass is the measure of the amount of matter in an object that never changes okay weight changes like your weight on the moon is different than your weight here on earth because weight is defined as the force that gravity exerts on an object and the gravity is determined by how large the uh how large the earth is or how large the moon is gravitational pull depends on the size of the planet right now, another definition tucked in there is matter. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Here is a quick example on this. I don't want to spend too much time on mass versus weight. Just realize that mass doesn't change wherever you are, but your weight does. Even the tiniest amount when you're at the top of Mount Everest versus the bottom of, uh, let's say, Death Valley right? The gravitational pull is slightly different, so your weight can even change on Earth. Here we go. Example, an astronaut has the same mass on Earth as he does on the moon, but he weighs about seven times less on the moon due to a smaller gravitational pull, okay? So I just wanted to mention that really quick. No calculations or problems, really. All right, let's get back to um, base units, derived units, prefixes, Let's take that information and then move to the next step. Now, after we have kind of a very, very small intro to things like milli, centi, kilo, deca, things like that, not deca, but deci, keep that in your mind as we move into this next section. And that next section is uncertainty in measurement. All right, let's get some notes down for uncertainty in measurement. Every measurement has some degree of uncertainty associated with it. I'm measuring something, okay? I'm not counting. If I count five apples in my hand, one, one, two, three, four, five apples, no uncertainty there. Okay, I'm not counting, I'm measuring. Anytime you measure something, there's a little bit of uncertainty involved, okay? Every measurement has some degree of uncertainty associated with it. 
The uncertainty depends on the precision of the measurement or even the precision of the instrument being used to do the measuring. As an example, do the following two grapefruits weigh the same? I have grapefruit one on the left and I got grapefruit two on the right. Okay? Well, in one instance, if I'm using, say, a bathroom scale and I plop both grapefruits on the bathroom scale individually, they both weighed 1.5 pounds. They weigh the same. Now, what if I'm using a much more uh, elite measuring instrument, such as an analytical balance? Well, grapefruit one weighs 1.476, and the other guy weighs slightly over 1.5 pounds. Now they don't weigh the same. They weigh different. So the answer is, uh, do these two grapefruits weigh the same? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Well, why is it yes and no? Well, if you look at the first measurement on the bathroom scale, 1.5 pounds was the answer to both. We only went as far right as the tenths place, one decimal place, whereas the analytical balance, which would, it recorded the, the weight with much more precision, three decimal places, okay? So why, do, why is my answer yes and no? Because it depends on the precision of the measuring device or the instrument being used. Bathroom scale is not as precise as the analytical balance. All right, I got that little squiggly line there, which means I'm doing a different example now. It says, which measurement below has the most uncertainty associated with it? Which measurement, this is the second sentence now, which measurement is the most precise? All right, so from the, in real time, which measurement below has the most uncertainty? Which measurement is the most precise? Now, give me some time here as I sketch these two rulers. Okay, these rulers are both in centimeters, but the ruler on top, it only gives me one, two, three, and four. Those are my little graduations or tick marks. The ruler on the bottom is showing me the tenths place. So the ruler on top is only showing me the ones place, one, two, three, four. The ruler on the bottom is showing me tenths. In between each number, one, two, three, and four, I've got 10 little tick marks, okay? So the metal nail, according to the top ruler, I know for sure it's in between one and two because the one and two are tick marks. They're there, I can see them. My best guess is the eight. So this is 1.8 centimeters, okay? That has two significant figures. First time we've seen that phrase, two significant figures. More on that in a second. The one was my certain digit. There was no guessing with that one. The 0.8, that's my best guess. That's my uncertain digit. Now, look at the bottom ruler. I know it's very tight, but trust me, if you get really, really close up, the end of that nail is for sure in between 1.8 and 1.9. And the 1.8 and the 1.9 are tick marks. They are there. I can see them. They're tiny little ticks. And then the second eight there is my guess. I guessed it was closer to 1.9 than 1.8. So now I have two certain digits instead of one, but I always have just one uncertain digit, one best guess. So this guy, 1.88 centimeters, this is three significant figures, All right? So it, you probably would have been able to guess that the second ruler, the bottom ruler is the more precise ruler. But this is why it produces a measurement 1.88 centimeters with three significant figures which is more than the 1.8 centimeters above so the measurement is the most precise and if it's the most precise it has the least amount of uncertainty all right new page of notes here i'm continuing with those two rulers and especially with that last statement which was the more precise the measurement, the least amount of uncertainty associated with it. So in other words, the greater the number of significant figures, right? I had 1.88 centimeters versus just 1.8 centimeters. The greater the amount of significant figures there are, the lesser the amount of uncertainty. All right. So moving forward with this, there is a bullet point on this page and it has the following statement after the bullet point. It says, a measurement's uncertainty 
is expressed by the number of significant figures. And the number of significant figures, by the way, are all the known digits, all the known um, values, or the, let's call them digits, all the known digits plus my one best what? Plus your one best guess. So significant figures, it's the number of certain digits and one uncertain digit. That one uncertain digit is your best guess. So I know I'm beating this over the head here, I'm beating a dead horse here, but the second bullet point says the same thing we've seen. The greater the number of sig figs, the lower the degree of uncertainty involved in that measurement, all right? All right, so as you might expect, we are going to want to practice this, right? We're going to do so in just a second. But I've got a third bullet point I want to write out here about significant figures, and then we'll do practice problems on sig figs in the next video. So it says, the greater the number of significant figures, the more precise the measurement is. So these two bullet points at the end here are kind of saying the same thing. The greater the number of significant figures, the lower the degree of uncertainty in the measurement. The greater the number of significant figures, the more precise the measurement is. All right, so types of error in measurement, we're gonna talk about this in the next video, that will involve uh, significant figure practice problems. That's gonna be uh, coming up next, so stick around for that, okay? And if you like the way I do these handwritten chemistry notes, I've got the full course general chemistry, full course organic chemistry notes, and they're all available at chemistrynotes.com. So stick around, section one, video number three, coming up next.